Good morning, church family. Happy Reformation Day. I decided I was going to be the guy to say that to everyone this morning, and Noah, our student director, beat me to it. He grabbed my shoulders, and he was like, it's Reformation Sunday. This is the perfect day to end a series like we've been in on the five solas of the Reformation. If you're new, we've been looking at the five main theological truths that were at the heart of the Protestant Reformation. Um, These were truths found in Scripture that the church of that day had lost sight of, and we run the risk of losing sight of as well. And I've summarized all of them in one sentence. Here are the solas that we've covered in this series. We are justified, or made right with God, by grace alone, on the basis of Christ's blood and righteousness alone, through the means of faith alone, for the ultimate glory of God alone, as taught finally and decisively in the Scripture alone. So the Roman Catholic Church had a theology that involved grace, faith, Christ, God's glory, and the Scripture. And so what was the fight about? It was about the word alone. That's what so many Reformers were facing death over. Because when we say grace alone and faith alone... We're confessing that God saves apart from any work of our own. So the equation is not faith plus works equals justification. God accomplishes salvation apart from our collaboration. And when we say Christ alone, we mean that the only grounds for justification is the righteous Son of God dying on the cross. There is no co-redeemer, there is no co-mediator that stands beside him. Christ alone. When we say scripture alone, we're saying that the scripture is the final and decisive authority of God. It is his word breathed out by him perfectly and sufficiently conveying his authority over our lives. And so what we are not saying is that a pope in history or a pastor or a Christian celebrity can speak on the authority level with Scripture. That has never happened in the history of the world. We're not saying God plus the Pope is the final authority. We are saying God's Word alone is the final authority. The Reformation comes down to the word alone, and this isn't the finer points of theology. These are central to everything that we believe who God is, who we are, how we come to know Him. And the result of recapturing these truths is that there's a perspective shift. We begin to see humans as completely insufficient in the work of salvation and God as sola sufficient, alone sufficient to accomplish salvation. So in other words, these solas are so important because they strip humanity of the glory that belongs to God. God alone is glorified. So the Protestant Reformation has been rightfully called the Reformation of God's glory because it is going back to the truth that salvation is Him. It belongs to Him and not us. So today we're looking at that fifth sola, soli deo gloria, the glory of God alone. It's the logical conclusion of all of the solas. God is glorified in salvation, and that is amazing news. So you guys have gathered this. I'm a millennial, and I feel like we get a bad rap. Um, We are not that bad. As long as we all get the ribbon in life, we will be fine. That's my one joke. Thank you for laughing. (laughs) So I'm a millennial. I'm a child of the 90s, and I need to tell you, my, my mom had the quintessential relic of the 90s, and it was the shoulder home video camera the kind that you slid the VHS into to record, and it had the eyepiece, so my mom walked around squinting like she was on a camera crew. So we had that, and the result is my whole childhood has been recorded on a wall of VHS tapes at my parents' house. And you think, oh, that's so cool. If you're a millennial, you're thinking, oh, I have that one video. or It's not that great because there's some things that you need to bury, like the 10-year-old Chris, and he comes back up in these videos Anyway, we have, we have a video of me and my sister. I'm probably about two years old. She's probably about four years old. And we're standing on chairs at the sink doing the dishes. 
So we've got those massive yellow gloves on, and we are, as you can imagine, we're making a worse mess than when we started. We're not helping at all. The kitchen is going to be in way worse shape than when we started. Nothing is being accomplished. And so when you watch the video, you see all this, and the thought is not, wow, mom had some really great help at such a young age. The thought is, wow, we were not moving to help mom. Mom was moving to us. Because mom could have said, I need to clean the kitchen, go play. But when you watch these videos, mom is very much drawing us in, letting us in. And she's going to take care of the mess. When we say soli deo gloria, we aren't just saying, God alone gets the glory. That in itself is not super controversial. We're also confessing how God gets the glory. And it's not by any of us moving to God. It's by God moving to us. And if we believe that we have ascended to God by anything we have done, it is a delusion. Because from him, through him, and to him are all things, as Paul says. If we believe that salvation is God beckoning us and us making our way to God, then the glory for the most important change in our lives really can go to us. But the gospel is not that we made our way to God. He made his way to a cross for us. So in the 16th century, Martin Luther was opposing something that he called the theology of glory. And it was this attitude and belief that God's glory was attained or reached through the ascent of human reason. So the idea was men could contemplate God's word and grow and understand, and they would begin to arrive at the unveiling of God's glory. That was the general attitude he was addressing. And the concept is something we all know. If you want to see the view, you have to make the climb. You have to ascend the hill. You have to grow, develop, and become something great in order to perceive God in himself. In other words, the principle is he must increase, and so I must increase. When I say it that way, that, it obviously sounds wrong. But in what I'm describing, you're hearing something familiar. Because this is how glory comes in the way the world works. Think of all the messaging, the stories, hopefully not any sermons you've heard. But the message of the world is, if you want to arrive at something great, then you have to become something great. And the problem with the mountain to God is it's the hill that no one can climb. No one by their own works will ascend to the glory of God. Because we've all fallen short of the glory of God. No one understands, no one seeks God. No one has any hope of moving themselves to that glory. So if God's glory is going to be seen, he is making the trek to us. Luther responded with this in the Heidelberg Disputation. He said, It is not sufficient for anyone and does him no good to recognize God in his glory and majesty unless he recognizes him in the humility and shame of the cross. Luther is saying, The one who tries to uncover the glory of God by climbing the intellectual tower and finding God, God's glory in his own way is going to find absolutely nothing. He will not take one step in the right direction. But the one who loses their faith in all of their abilities to arrive at God's glory and goes to the cross and is brought low by the cross is the one who is going to uncover the glory of God. It's the one who crucifies their self-reliance And they go to the cross because they recognize that if anything is going to change, if we are going to receive the glory that we were created to know, it's going to be by Jesus coming to us. Later on, Martin Luther says, He is not righteous who does much, but he who, without work, believes much in Christ. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn with me to John 17. We're going to look at the high priestly prayer in order to see how God is glorified in the cross. Not through our works towards him, but through his work. Let me give you some context. These are the last moments between Jesus and his disciples. He's washed their feet. He's given them his last teaching in preparation for his death. And he prays in front of them. 
This is a public prayer. We call it the high priestly prayer. Look at verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your, pre- your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So there's a lot of glory statements here. And that I can't get to everything, but I want you to catch something that's happening in the prayer. Jesus is walking into the beginnings of his suffering. He's beginning his journey to the cross. And the prayer is shocking. Jesus is saying, the hour is here, this is it, and my request, God, is that you glorify glorify me that I may glorify you. Do you find something strange there? I do. Because Jesus is not saying, okay, I need to be humiliated in this death so that I can be risen, exalted, and glorified. He's saying, the hour is here, and I pray that in my suffering... I am glorified, and Father, you are glorified. How on earth is Jesus going to be glorified through being beaten, mocked, and crucified like a criminal in the most horrific act in history? More than that, how is the Father going to be glorified through the Son undergoing that? Jesus answers it in verse 2. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. When Jesus Christ headed to the cross, he was going to unveil the only eternal life-giving sacrifice. The cross is the grand summary of Jesus' claim to be the way back to the Father. He is recognizing something that we should recognize, and that's if we want to see the glory of God, we have to look at how he alone is going to sufficiently purchase that for us. He is the one who has been appointed with the authority to give life And so we must set our gaze to Calvary to see God's perfect love, mercy, and justice played out in this wrath-bearing moment. The reason why Jesus Christ is glorified on the cross is because he is being presented to the world as the only life giver. How amazing is that? He is the alone is the accomplisher of salvation. He is going to be lifted up to draw all people to himself. And so the reason why that cross is so shockingly glorious is because God is moving towards sinners in the cross. He's showing that the whole work of salvation is God alone. Not on the basis of the sinners. They are not even the focal point of what he's saying. It's on the basis of God. That is amazing. I uh, was thinking about this yesterday, a little context. My son loves Toy Story right now. He's about to be Woody tonight, my two-year-old. And so I have eccentric moments with him. That's normal. I ran in as I was thinking about these things, and I said, God is glorified when Jesus goes to the cross. And he said, yeehaw! I was like, you get it, son. Jesus is not just glorified through the, through the cross, he is glorified on the cross but he, because he is presented to the world as the accomplisher of salvation and the grantor of eternal life. How is the Father glorified? Jesus prayed for that too. Look back at verse 2. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. God is sending Jesus in this moment to accomplish salvation for those that he has chosen. So when you look to the cross, the glory that you see is the Father's sovereign decree over his elect coming to fruition. 
Jesus Christ gave the elect to Jesus, and that salvation is being accomplished on the cross. So the Father is glorified because his sovereign decree is coming about. Now look at verse 6. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All of mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. There is so much there, but consider this. Jesus is saying, I have shown, Father, who you are to those that you have given me. They were chosen, you gave them to me, I have given them your word and they have kept it. And so what Jesus is saying is the work you gave me was manifesting who you are to those that you have chosen and I have done that. And then he says, all are mine. Or he says, all mine are yours and yours are mine and I am glorified in them. So I want you to think about that phrase, I am glorified in them. What is in view here is not anything that the disciples have done to this point. All that Jesus has confessed is what he has accomplished with the Father. And so the way God is glorified in them is not by their own choosing, their own works, their own collaboration. It is by God's work alone, manifesting in the redeemed. My sister and I stood on those chairs at the sink, and we thought that we had accomplished something, but it was delusion. Something was going to be accomplished despite us. So when Jesus says, I'm glorified in them, he's not talking about their ability to glorify God. The reason is for his work in them. The focus is God and his son. I've had these really grievous experiences with some unbelievers. Maybe you've had experiences like this, but several have told me that in their past experience with Christians, they felt as if this person thought that they were better than them. Now, when you get to the, the bottom of that issue, that, like, that generalization is really complicated. I don't, I don't want you to really think about that. But we, when we hear that, we are all grieved. Because if you have tasted salvation, you know <laughs> you were not saved by any virtue in you. And so for someone to think that, perceive that you feel that way, that grieves us. I want you to consider this. And I want listen very carefully because this is, this is going to sound like a hot take. I believe it's true. If the basis of our salvation is a choice that we made, that means that we, in a sense, are better than some other people. There is something in us, some virtue in us, that was able to arrive at what is most valuable. But if our rescue has come about by the work of God alone, the accomplishment of God alone, we know as a concrete fact that there is nothing good about us, nothing in us that merited that salvation. It is only God's sovereign decree to save, accomplished by Jesus Christ. The way I can look at someone who is yet to believe in Jesus and know that I am not, I am not in any way better than, than them is because Jesus Christ saved me despite me. That's what this high priestly prayer shows us. I want you to think about this too. I I used to tell students every time I had the chance, you do well to remember every single day that you're going to stand before Jesus. Like if you remembered that every day, you would live a better day. (laughs) And we know what that interaction is like. Jesus is going to look at us and say one of two things. Well done, good and faithful servant. Or, depart from me, I never knew you. This is crazy to think about. His statements are all about works, right? So when he says, well done, you you can read that on the surface and think, 
Oh, he's commending my works. There's some glory headed my way right there. If I'm in Christ. When, when Jesus says that to anyone in this room on that day, he will only be saying that to the glory of God. Because those were the works, when he says well done, those were the works prepared beforehand by God that you would walk in them. Those were the works that you did, but it really wasn't you, but the grace of God working through you. On the day that Jesus Christ says well done, he is saying that to the glory of God alone. Isn't that amazing? That is amazing news. Now here's the question. Does, God, does the Bible say that we will be glorified? Like I have just gone to such great lengths to say that God alone gets the glory. Doesn't the Bible talk about a glorification? Those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. What do we do with that? How is God alone glorified when we see our own glorification in the Scripture? It's true, we will be glorified into a resurrected, death-free, sin-free existence. A ruling existence. We will reign with Christ. And that sounds very glorious. I want you to see the last part of this priestly prayer, though. This is amazing. Look at verse 24. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. The reason why we will be glorified is to see Christ's glory. That is a means by which God is glorified. God is not sharing his glory with another. On the day that I am glorified and I take on the resurrected body, there is only one that is going to get the glory for that, and that is the Father and the Lamb. Our glorification is not God's commitment to our glory. It's his commitment to his glory. The reason why we're going to be glorified is to the eternal praise of God. I know you're in John 17. If you can, turn with me really fast to Revelation 7. I want to show you the final picture of our glorification to the glory of God. John gets a vision of the last things. God being glorified in the eternal state. And this is what he says in verse 9 of Revelation 7. After this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. So that is the redeemed who have been glorified. And crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. That is what glorification is for. Glorification is for the reigning God and his Lamb forever. You will be glorified to the eternal praise of God. For him, through him, and to him are all things. And he has invited us into that ultimate purpose for creation. That's the end. That's what it's all about. The reason why Christianity is so different from other world religions is it's not about you ascending to something great. It is about a God who descended to you in the humility and shame of the cross so that you might be to the praise of his glory forever. The only way we're going to see the glory of God is it's not through our descent. It's through the beaten, mocked, and crucified Savior who purchased eternal life for us. He is glorified in what he has accomplished in the redeemed And they are glorified to the eternal praise of God. Pray with me. 
Father, in, the, in these words you've given us, from the mouth of Christ, we see the purpose of everything. The culmination of all of redemptive history, the purpose of the image of God, completely and perfectly fulfilled in this shocking way. It is glorious. And Father, I pray that as we see that, we would align every aspect of our life to the glory of God being revealed. I pray that the idea of you being glorified in us through your work would take root in us. I pray that it would lead us into conversations that we would have otherwise been timid to pursue. God, I pray that it would make us think about our rest differently. What we spend our mind contemplating. Father, I pray that it would take root in our relationships. I pray that we would speak to one another to the glory of God and not to obscure it with our own glory. I pray that we would not be those who keep our grip on the glory of our own name but discard it. We love you, Father, and we trust you to accomplish these things in us to the praise of your name. It's in your name. Amen.